All right, so my name is Frank Tanning Grundholm. I'm responsible globally for our HVACR sales. And uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, continuing from where Michele left off uh, with the energy efficiency on uh, the supermarket refrigeration systems. Looking a little bit into the energy consumption and the uh, refrigeration portion of it, uh, specifying energy efficient solutions and also how to get the most out of the efficiency uh, in a refrigeration system. So when you look at the total energy usage in a supermarket, more than 50% of the energy usage in most supermarkets actually come from the refrigeration system. So when you want to optimize the energy usage of a supermarket, it's imperative that, that you look at the cooling side of the entire thing. A lot of supermarkets have been looking at the lighting uh, uh, and there's been a lot of exchanges into LED systems uh, and that of course helps and it's an easy, relatively easy fix in many cases. But the big, the big bucks are really in the, in the energy uh, that you have on the cooling side. And as Michaela also very rightly mentioned, uh, there are a lot of opportunities of really improving on that side of, uh, of the system. One of the things is that most systems are getting specified at full load. Nobody really specifies solutions based on the usage over a load cycle. So while some systems are very efficient at full load, when you start looking at the part load conditions, you get much bigger discrepancies and the most efficient at full load might not even be the most efficient at part load. So, so this means that you are assuming that you have a very efficient system, but based on the load profile you have, you actually don't. So, so that's a, something that we need to look at and we need to look at how we specify in general, not just on the compressors, but also on our pumps, our fan applications, in generally look at, at how do we, what is the actual load profile that a system has, and then ask the manufacturers to look at providing energy usage estimates over that load profile. The other aspect of it is that the application energy usage is actually not the only inefficiency in the system. Power quality also causes inefficiencies. That is not directly reflected in the regular energy bills because your regular energy bill is the active load current that you're using, that you're charged by the kilowatt hours to by the utility. But a lot of utilities are starting to look at exchanging the metering in systems because right now, today, we all know that we have these uh, capacitor banks installed to correct what is called the displacement power factor. And uh, that's a KVA charge that you get from the utility if you have too high displacement power factor or actually too low because the lower it is, the worse it is. Uh, then the, the utility will start charging you penalties on your what is called non wattage use. Another part is that when we look at the HVAC systems, quite often we have integrated part load value uh, that, that we can look at and compare equipment, but for refrigeration systems, that is not uh, widely applied. So, so, so we, we, need, we need an approach that emulates what IPLV actually will do, but in the refrigeration world, and, and that's where a load cycle can easily be established. It doesn't have to be accurate. It just has to be approximately what you would expect at maybe four or eight uh, different load points, depending on how close you want to get and how much we're talking about. A system is complex, and especially where, I mean, if you look at just a, a, a fan that's supplying air into a building, it's a relatively easy system because you've got an inlet, you've got an outlet, and, and all your energy consumption has been in between your inlet and your outlet. When you look at a refrigeration system, it's a closed loop operation. So you've got your condenser, you've got your evaporator, you've got your compressors, and, and, and it, it, all, it all goes into influencing each other. So you might optimize the fan operation on your cooling tower, but that might have a negative effect on your compressor system. It might have a negative effect on where you might have liquid in the system. And if you've got uh, too, too much liquid in the wrong places, you might actually cause damages. Uh,
So, so it's re it, what I was talking about is really the complexity of a, a refrigeration system compared to other systems. Uh, if you look at a fan system or a pump system, traditionally, you just have an input and an output, and the, the, the whole application is that one motor operation. So when you change the energy efficiency of your fan, the entire energy efficiency of the system changes. The challenge with the refrigeration system is that you might be doing something on your cooling tower that optimizes the energy efficiency and the energy usage of the cooling tower, but that might have an adverse effect on the compressor operation, and that thereby the whole system might be less efficient potentially than what it would have been without messing with the with the cooling tower. So, so you really need to look at a holistic systems view when we talk about refrigeration to get the best energy optimization. And there are a lot of approaches that go in and, and only optimize on individual application because the pumps and fans are easy to optimize on. If you're on the secondary side of the system, it's a, it's a different story. That's a pure pumping application. So the brine that you pump around into, into your store coolers is, is really a much simpler application. But if you have a, a on the primary side where you've got a closed loop system with three, is essentially three applications, condenser, evaporator, and the compressor, then then you need to look at the at the whole system. When we look at it, the reason why you, that is important becomes very clear, because what you can see is the cooling tower fans are typically or condenser fans are typically the ones that have the lowest energy consumption in the whole system. The highest energy consumption is actually on the on the compressors. And then you have the, the circulators in the, in the, on the secondary side and primary circulation that are in a medium position, really. So, so the, if you have adverse effect on the energy consumption of the compressor, you have adverse effect on the total energy efficiency of the entire system. So, so always look at the complete system when you start optimizing. And quite often, the best place to start the optimization is really looking at the compression and how do you manage the compressors? How do you control the compressors? How do you stage on and off? Get, do you have the most efficient way of controlling that? And then applying variable speed, as was also mentioned earlier, is a very good way to increase the stability because as you stage on and off, you also increase fluctuations. And the more fluctuations you have, the more you're going over and above and below. And so that essentially means that you have to, if you have to maintain five degrees C in your cooler, then in order to do that, if you have high fluctuations, your, your set point actually might have to be four or three degrees. Now the risk is that you go too low and you could potentially go into freezing. So, so, so you need to narrow the control band in order to raise the set point. As you can raise the set point because you've got a ne more narrow control band, you can also optimize the energy uh, usage in the system. And the biggest fluctuations are in most systems caused by the compressor, which is also the highest energy consumer. So at the same time as you're optimizing the energy usage on the compressor, based on the mere physics of the compressor, you also have the opportunity of optimizing your system by changing your set points because you narrow the control band. Another part that's crucial is looking at the energy efficiency. There's a lot of different motors in the market. And if we take it from, from uh, one side, then I mean, standard induction motors today are typically so from most manufacturers, i.e. three, there are some uh, that, uh, let me just get my pointer back, i.e. three motors, that's this curve. Some have i.e. four motors in induction or permanent magnet motors in, in i.e. four, but there are new technologies coming into the market. Mo one of the most recent ones is ferroid-assisted synchronous reluctance motors that go all the way up to an i.e. five. What you can see also, what I talked about earlier, is at full load, Yes, an IE5, of course, still is a little more efficient than an IE4 and an IE3, but it's a very small difference. When you get down into the part load range, however, the delta becomes a lot bigger, especially if you go from an IE3 to an IE5. There's a, there's a massive change, really, on the part load. And if most of your operation is in the lower uh, proportion of this, then you have a substantial opportunity of savings when you apply uh, higher efficiency motors. If you're almost always operating at full range, it's going to have a marginal impact. 
So that's why your load profile is really important. So if you look at, uh, I mean, screw compressors are uh, have traditionally had a reasonably good uh, control at part load. But but it, when you look at applying, for instance, a, a, a variable speed control relative to a, a direct online with a slide valve, then you can look at the ER increases uh, based on evaporation temperatures. And you can see that at part load, the full load, of course, you don't have the losses that you have having the electronics in the drive. So for that reason, of course, you have some additional losses when you get into the high load area. But when you're in, in the part load area, there's a substantial delta also on the part load. If you look at the, at the EER increases relative to VFD controls or variable speed control relative to DOL with a, with a slide valve. Additionally, you can add the cascade control and then you can manage your, your rack depending on, of course, if you've got 12 compressors in the rack, then you get pretty relatively small steps in, in your rack. And then you maybe have, if you've got a very large rack, only a couple of them with speed control, just to smooth out the steps in, in that. But, but it, it's really important that you, that you also make sure that you have uh, someone who actually knows what is the impact of changing control schemes in a refrigeration system when you start doing your retrofits. So the low energy consumption, uh, additionally, you get much lower starting currents when you apply variable speed than you do when you have DOL. You quite often have situations where you have a large back pressure if there's something uh, not entirely working the way it, it, it's supposed to. So if you've got older systems, you can have uh, valves that are that are a little sluggish in how they open and close. With a variable speed control, you get a more smooth starting and thereby you avoid the overload on the, on the system. Also, you manage your noise levels much better because the, the compressors are generally the more noisy part of the installation. And by reducing the speed on a compressor uh, within, of course, the manufacturer allows speed ranges, then you can also manage your, uh, your, your noise levels. You can reduce your maintenance because the, if you run at part speed, then also the wear and tear on equipment is lower. And then as mentioned already, uh, you have some savings opportunities by going from a single large compressor, which has a more narrow speed range to a cascade where you can have the full range of the steps covered by the uh, variable speed, and then the capacity ranges you cover by multiple compressors. Again, when you then look at additionally adding digitalization and monitoring to the system, then you have the uh, additional opportunities of reducing on your cost, extending your asset life by up to 30%, according to the investigations that we've made. You can reduce the downtime. Now, in a refrigeration system, downtime is critical because for food safety reasons, you have to maintain a certain temperature in your freezers and in your coolers. If you don't, then you essentially have to throw away all the food that's in it. And if there is an inspection, that can become very expensive and you risk essentially also store shutdowns uh, if you're too frequently outside the allowed temperature ranges. So, so managing your downtime and reducing the risk of downtime on your refrigeration system is critical in a supermarket. So in summary, over 50% of the consumption is uh, from energy uh, to the refrigeration system. Legislation on building energy performance gets stricter, and we are expecting that this will also funnel into the requirements on supermarkets uh, and commercial refrigeration. System components uh, efficiencies are getting stricter, so there will be more and more regulation around what are you allowed what types of components are you allowed to sell it hasn't quite uh, hit uh, all of the uh, parts outside the traditional HVACR systems but it is coming and we are seeing a massive push towards that drives help with the energy efficiency and also when you do the right selections uh, you can also manage your power quality in the in the system but uh, but you need to really look at, at that side as well and digitalization, of course, can help you with, uh, with the additional monitoring so that you avoid your downtime risks. So that's uh, cutting the last part a little bit short in the interest of uh, technical issues. Um.